What's up, Daddy Yo and Jazz ladies out there? This is your boy Sasha Also, broadcasting live from the cabaret in the sky. And when I'm not busy doing my soloing on my two horn, I just tune in to the Olympics presents We All Be News and Radio. Oh, yeah. Hey, what's up, Daddy Yo and this is r 2 c 2 h the artist, and welcome to another wonderful edition of We All Be News and Radio. That, of course, was Little Willie John with Fever, the, basically the template uh, for some say soul, soul music. He actually did that when he was not even 20 years old. So it's amazing to have a voice like that come from a guy that was so small in physical stature, but yet so bigger than life. And uh, I just got through reading this wonderful book, which is also the uh, basis for tonight's topic called Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and the Birth of Soul, written by Sister Susan Whittle and Kevin John, one of Little Willie John's sons, with a forward, a very insightful forward by Stevie Wonder. And once again, everybody, you can join this conversation tonight. It will be a very hot topic. Uh, Detroit is hot right now, and also the history of Detroit music is a very stable. Detroit ranks up there with New Orleans and Memphis and Chicago and all them great places where they had a great live music scene from the last century that permeates the uh, music scene of today. So once again, tonight's topic is Peeve Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and The Birth of Soul. Feel free to call in area code 646-652-4593. Once again, that's area code 646-652-4593. 4593. If you're scared to get on the air, you hit us, hit us up via email at r2c2h2 at gmail.com. Once again, that's alphabet R, numeric 2, alphabet C, numeric 2, alphabet H, numeric 2, at gmail.com. We're about to open up the chat room, so if you don't want to do the email thing or call in and uh, express your point of view or questions or comments for our distinguished panel, uh, feel free to drop a line or two in the chat room, and I might read your questions or your comments on the air. So we're going to move on and introduce our, our wonderful uh, guests, the people that are behind this wonderful book, Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and the Birth of Soul. Uh, one person I'm going to talk to right now, I know he's uh, got attention uh, divided between this wonderful program, but also uh, Detroit Tigers are doing pretty well. I don't know if y'all been on a rock lately, but the Detroit Tigers are making a serious run uh, for a World Series redemption right now. I'm on the line with a veteran music journalist and big-time Willie John fan, and one of the co-authors of Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and the Birth of Soul, Sister Susan Whittle. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Wow, welcome to We All Be Radio. Thanks, thanks. It's great to be here. So I know you uh you pay attention with your Detroit Tigers out there. I guess Detroit is hot right now, I mean it's like you know, and you know, I I can I can link into the book because Willie Willie John was a big baseball fan too. Yeah, he definitely was. But I was like I'm just I'm just interested because it's like Detroit is has undergone a renaissance lately in terms of its image right now. Uh culturally speaking, it's like it started with the uh redemption of the auto industry a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh and also with the revival of baseball uh, and also the revival of his history, of his story history. And how do you feel a little Willie John fits into this whole thing of Detroit uh, Renaissance? Well, I, th- I think there's a growing uh, awareness among both younger people and, uh, and, and some older, but a lot of younger people are getting hipper to the fact that there was a whole music scene before Motown that is incredibly important and a whole a slew of singers that were really important that they helped kind of pave the way for Motown. And it's like our history, our music history goes way back, way, way back. And it's just that Motown has gotten all the attention and publicity and has many, there have been many books written about it, but we really need to revisit and remember and um, be inspired by some of these greats that that came along in the 50s, especially for singers, but you can go back even further for the jazz players and all that. 
Okay. It, it, it's a. I, I know um, next year at the jazz festival in Detroit, they're going to have like a. They're going to have us talk about Willie and and uh, make a little appearance in their talk tent and talk about this very subject that Detroit and the pre Motown era really needs to be looked at and we can tie um bring it up to the present with all the the, the exciting stuff going on right now and m- the music scene is particularly healthy right now really interesting that's true I guess Detroit always had a way of uh having its own thing going on I mean I just think of Detroit I think of um I do think of Motown but also I think of the auto industry I mean Motor City of course but also, I mean, I just think that it's a hotbed for so many different things in terms of uh, politics as well as in sports and entertainment. And I want to introduce uh, one of your co-authors, Brother brother Kevin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. How you doing, man? That's on the heavy. This is Brother Kevin John, the co-author of Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and the Birth of Soul. And also the proud son of Little Willie John, and also I believe Brother Cajun. I mean, I'm not being under your nickname. I mean, your brother Keith. Is Keith John there as well? Yes, I'm here. How you doing? I only have both of you guys on. I mean, I like the dynamic duo. I mean, I got inseparable. <laughs> it's your brother Keith John. I'll, 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 I'll just keep up. Brother Keith John, we're good team players. I'm sorry. Uh, that's cool. I mean, yeah, let's, y'all, y'all share a part of y'all father's legacy. It's a very important legacy that needs to be better known. And this brother, Keith John, you also was the only male backup singer for Stevie Wonder, who was also a big Little Willie John fan. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely the second part. <laughs> the first part, yeah, okay, that's true, too. But the second part is, yeah, Steve, Steve was really a, a big fan of my, of my father's. You know, in, in fact, when... Um, in 1996, when my father was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Steve presented the uh, the, the uh, award to my mom and to my to my brother, and Keith was the one that actually sang uh, with Stevie. He sang Fever to present the the award to them. Oh wow, that's man! I knew it, that stuff was in the book. I knew it, I was talking to Sister Susan, a widow. She's on the line. I know she. I mean, Detroit Tiger, y'all y'all got it going on in Detroit right now. And also, I raised the, the question to her about. How you feel about the uh, the redemption of Detroit going on right now through the media? I know they got those slick car commercials. I'm talking about the auto industry booming, and you got the the, the Detroit Tigers doing their thing, and you also got Little Willie John making his uh, comeback in terms of in the consciousness the consciousness of the people. Arguably Detroit's first R and B star, uh, having his day now. How do y'all feel about uh, the uh, image of Detroit right now? Well, I mean, I would say, I would say, I think we're definitely making a comeback, right? and uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting. I find that in in towns where uh, the nation uh, tends to look down on them a little bit, if their sports teams get going, that it, it just seems like it just gives them kind of a lift up. You know, it's just like it just lifts them up. And uh, in in this case, we got our Lions, and they're undefeated. They're, they're jamming and. And our Tigers, Tigers are playing at the, at this moment. They're in the American uh, League Championship Series, so um, they're playing a tough a Texas team. But you know what? These these Tigers, they 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 seem to do it when they need to do it. And so, you know, we're proud of them. And 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 now they have all eyes on the city. So every time you bring all eyes uh, to a place like the place like this, with with all the, it, it's magnificent. It's it's it, it's a good town, man. I mean, you know, you're always going to have ups and downs, and and so we just ride the wave. But I, I like where where we're sitting right now. Go Lions! That's yeah. great. <laughs> Go Tigers! Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I know y'all. It got a little bit static coming from your end, uh, brother Keith, on your phone. I don't know if uh, trying to work with the static, but people are kind of having a hard time hearing you uh, talk about uh, what you just said, like Detroit and whatnot. But I, I heard you. But I, I asked uh, Sister Susan. Uh, Susan's on the line as well. Um, your your father is like a he's a phenomenal figure in uh, music history, in American music history. But I think the problem with with him, not with him, but as far as remembers, that he was such a transitional figure. Because like y'all said in the book, uh, what he was doing, it was no name, it was beyond category. Like what yeah, Duke Ellington yeah. would say, it was nothing to describe the type of yeah. performance and singing he was doing. Exactly, and you know Ray Charles gets a lot of credit for bringing 
gospel uh, together into popular music. But really, you know, in Willie's voice, you can hear that too. And he doesn't really get credit for that, but he was doing it as early as, as Ray Charles or earlier. So they didn't really call it, they didn't know what to call it. It was just sort of a, you know, a really exciting sound, um, a sound that came out of church a little bit and sound that was innate. So... I, I think, you know, you're talking about Detroit, too. I wanted to make a point. I think Detroit's always been a tough place where you really have to fight to get anywhere, and that kind of gives us an edge when we're outside because um, people from Detroit don't expect to have anything given and given to them. And You know, Willie had to go out of Detroit to make it. He had to go to New York, and but he was, he was uh, road-ready and uh, polished up, and he just kicked, kicked butt when he got there. He was ready. Hey, I, I would say, like, uh, to y'all, that uh, Willie Charles, he, he, he really did embody Detroit. He was, like, the true underdog. Yeah. In terms of he was undersized, but he had a heart that was outsized. It was larger than life. Oh, yeah. I mean, he just really was a go-getter, who I could tell in the book. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, he was, like, um, his, one of his early managers, you know, he had three, four guys managing him at that one point, and... The one guy, Dave Usher, was telling me, Dave's in his 80s, he's still alive and kicking, but Dave said, you know, the, the sheer determination he saw in Willie, he's never seen in another person before, that determination to do something and to get somewhere. It was, you know, to, to couple that with a, with a great talent is really something, to have those two things in one person, you know. And definitely, I mean... I also I like to say, just speaking of uh, dog and determination, I, I look at the John brothers. I mean, I'm just reading like the last chapters of this book to show how y'all really had to pay dues and y'all had this this tenacity and this will, kind of like y'all father. I mean, y'all like like it runs in y'all family or something. We all refuse to be denied anything. Like y'all make the most out of the even the the worst or the or the least of situations. So well, that's family that's trait. That's yeah. That's what you have to do. I mean, I I I think. To be successful in any in- industry, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have pitfalls, and you're going to have uh, people that try to tell you tell you things like, hey, you know, you might you might want to do something else in in life because it's so many it's so competitive. It's so many people trying to do what you what you're trying to do. But uh, you know what? When you're trying to trying to continue with the legacy that, and, and especially in a situation like my father, where he was he was a lot of people to a lot of people he was an unsung hero. He, he didn't really get uh, what we consider to be the, the, the uh, notoriety that he should have gotten. Even though, I mean, I'm, among the fans, uh, among the fans, um, the people that knew him loved him, and his peers, like Jackie Wilson and Sam Cooke and all these people that were around back in that day, and even since then, they loved him, and they never, they'll never forget him. That's that's. What what uh, uh that that's one when I got a chance to talk to Aaron Neville that's one of the things that he told me he said man wasn't nobody bad like your daddy he said could nobody touch your daddy and he said well, I, that's somebody that people that heard him they never forget him I mean and 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 it's our our thing to try to keep keep the legacy going so people would at least get to know him through his music you know it's like I did a great job in terms of keeping the legacy going cause I know. Uh, before I get started into the book, there's a, there's a wonderful forward by, by Stevie Wonder, but also something you said, uh, Brother Keith, at the beginning, that you had four wishes concerning your father's legacy, and three out of four came true already. I guess the fourth one would be the movie. Yeah, that was... I, uh, I did you know, a long time ago. Are you breaking up? It's like a lot of... Uh, uh, Brother Keith, there's a lot of static coming on your phone. Are you breaking yeah, up? It's hard to hear. What kind of you like, too? I can hear you. We're hearing that too. No, but what I was saying is that, you know, as a, as a young person, I really had a, I had like a, a dream with, with four prongs, you might say, to it, and three of them have already taken place. Uh, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and his final recordings were released in, in 2008, and then now we have the book out, so now the only thing that's left is for the movie to happen. Hey, uh, uh, have you all been uh, talked to from anybody from Hollywood or anywhere who's interested in producing a movie based on your father's life? And I think, you know, people have talked, but there hasn't been anything concrete yet. Okay. 
Okay. Not a little thing. You know what? Wow. While we're talking, while we're talking, man, while we're talking man, we'd also like to get out there. We've been trying to find some video, some nice video of him performing. And, you know, we've been working on this project for a while, and we still have yet to find some video. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to find some video. And we don't even know. Maybe some of your listeners out there know of some video somewhere. So we're going to find it. It's out there. We're going to find it. There, re- there really should be um, a documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, there really should be a movie, a fig- you know, a regular movie about him. There's There's a lot of different things that should be done, but something that, would be great would be to have some sort of uh, well I think it, it could start with an unsung on BET you know right the problem with that of course is you really need the footage you need some video they've they've managed to do a few where they didn't have much film or video but mm-hmm. it didn't work that well and I, I know with all the times he played the Apollo there had to be somebody who had a camera out in that in that audience they they used to have cameras in the 50s you know hobby hobbyists they were just becoming really popular, home cameras and uh, video. Yeah. What is it, 16 millimeter, Super 8, whatever. So um, that and and he was on a lot of TV shows, and you hear that you know the the Dick Clark stuff is lost, or maybe it isn't lost, but so, it, so there's there's got to be something. But that's the same thing they said about his last recording that it was lost, right? When the exactly. camera tried to find it. Exactly. They, they told Kevin that for years, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we knew we knew better. We knew better because in '68, they actually Capitol actually sent us a dump of the recordings, and then they resurfaced back in, I think I want to say in uh, around the early '80s. So we knew that they were still at Capitol. They just hadn't been released yet. Didn't they? Didn't they um, say rather convincingly though that they had been lost? They couldn't find them. Is Brother Keith, are you there, Brother Kevin? Me well, yeah, 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 there, there, was, okay. there was talk about that, but we never really believed it, and we just kept trying to yeah, trying right. to search and find where it was, and then sure enough, it, it turned up in, in uh, 2008. I have to, you know, Kevin's very determined, and I, I think he kept this alive, and he kept it going. Um, as I, you know, a lot of families would have given up when Capitol right. said, oh, whoops, we lost it, we can't find it now, <laughs> sorry. Go away. <laughs> you know, it was you know, it was it was the other thing too. You know, the um, Capitol has a, a reputation for having some of the best vaults. You know, in in the music industry and how they protect their their masters. So I just couldn't believe. You know, they have all the uh, the old Beatles masters and you know. So I just couldn't believe that all of that was gone. They had the uh, I want to say the Nat King Cole um, Sinatra. You know, so they got a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. I, I mean, I think that too. Uh, I saw that YouTube posting y'all was able to find about. Uh, uh, he was on a show called Route Six Six, yeah. Route Sixty Six. How did that come about? How did y'all find that? I mean, it was like uh, several seconds of him, you know. But it's like it's amazing to see him like moving, and you can see like a little bit what people saw when they saw him performing a little bit in terms of his enthusiasm and his movement. Yeah, in just those few seconds, you can see that, right? You know what I thought was interesting about this, but too, if you go back and look at the video, you know, all the guys in the band are sitting there, they're playing. He, he's the only one that has a different kind of food on. Maybe it's just me that didn't notice that. It's kind of the oddball out, you know, there. But that was good for us because my sons have never seen their grandfather because he died long before they were born. So that was that was right. nice that they were able to find that. You know what? I, I think, because I, I had a friend who actually, a, a newspaper friend who's a geek about research like I am, he actually looked up that band name, and they were the house band at a big club in Memphis. Yeah, actually, you know what's funny? Uh, I saw it. Ben Branch. Ben Branch yeah, was yeah. the. Uh, he's from Memphis. But he was the band director for Operation Brad. The uh, Operation Brad basket band for Jesse Jackson. Oh. Yeah, he was the one that Dr. King was talking to. When he got shot. Oh my goodness. And a lot of my musician friends in Memphis is a running joke. He said, "Maybe they don't try to kill Ben Branch because he owns so many people of money back in Memphis." So he actually had to leave town because he owed so many people money. What? Uh But, like, Ben Branch, yeah, I know his name, too, but he actually was a band director from Memphis uh, yeah. who used to work with Jesse Jackson. I saw the book that Jesse Jackson actually wrote a left on your um, yeah. Willie Jones' behalf to get released from prison. Yeah, well, you know, just just to go back quickly to that section, though, to that to that snippet, you know, that was, that was, uh, that, that took place in Memphis, you know. 
I didn't wear it. A lot of places, a lot of things happened in Memphis. Like he's like uh, the the the, the, um, the Route 66. That was yeah, the Route 66. So okay. So what I've seen about the the jacket that Willie was wearing, he very likely, I think he was playing at that club. Okay. And, and the the film TV crew came in and. So for their scene, they didn't want a singer out front, so they probably had him sitting there doing the, you know, percussion. I was playing up for the camera, I got you. Yeah, but but as the singer, usually, you know, he wouldn't be wearing the same clothes as the band. He would be the front guy. So um, that's what I think happened. I think he was playing at that club. And Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I could do on my end. I'm in Memphis. I mean, I could hit up the Memphis room at the public library or something like that. And I'll talk to some people yeah. who are musicians. I might know a little bit about this story because I, you know, I get my little Willie's um, little Willie's. I mean, I, the fact that there's lack of any visuals, cause like even Soupy Sales, I'm, I'm a jazz fan, and the only thing we got a clip of Brown performing live is the Soupy Sales. Right. Uh, look, it's like a Rosetta Stone. I'm surprised that since he was on Soupy Sales, that they wouldn't have any footage of uh. Little Willie uh, John somewhere. Well, I think with the Clifford Brown stuff, that was some mm-hmm. collector who had, who collected it. So you'd have to find somebody who who kept the Willie footage because that Soupy show was on ABC uh, locally, Channel Seven, and they did record over a lot of their great stuff. That's the problem. Oh wow! So they didn't they, know what they had. Yeah, they didn't know what they had. They thought all oh, these music shows. Who cares? So it, it takes finding somebody who kept it, and I, I know there was a there was footage of Joe Messina from that same Soupy show. Mm-hmm. Joe Messina playing jazz. He was one of the Funk Brothers. Mm. They managed to find a back clip and use it in Standing in the Shadows of Motown. So there's little pieces of film out there from these Sweet. TV appearances. Well, hopefully it'll come up. I mean, I, the fact that I, I feel like the universe is responding to y'all. Y'all got favor in terms of. You know, this book coming out and uh, Little Willie John, you know, getting the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame after all those years of fighting. I think everything is a fight, and the things that are worth fighting for are also worth having. So, I mean, like, Willie John, his life is, I mean, he's to me, like, you know, he was friends with Jackie Rip Wilson, and he, you know, was good friends with Sugar Ray Robinson, and both these guys were boxers. I mean, Willie John was like a boxer. He fought for his life. He fought for his career. He fought for his uh, free will. And I can admire that. I mean, he just he is Detroit in, as far as I'm concerned. But also, I think it's interesting because throughout the book, the theme seems to be that he was an artist, artist, a mm-hmm. singer, singer. And so what that means that implies that he was a, an acquired taste for many in the in the public, but his peers knew his true genius. Mm-hmm. They understood the greatness of Willie Willie John. Kind of like you know when I talk, when I hear about comedians talk about somebody like Bill Hicks. Or when I hear about people talking about other people who might have been your favorite uh, artist or favorite entertainers, entertainer, but for you they just don't make it for you. But for some reason they're like the uh, they're the bridge, you know, mm-hmm. that everybody got to cross in order to get to the next level. You know what I was always impressed with too when I when I did research was the quality control, even when his life was kind of spiraling out of control at the end, mm-hmm. his, his reviews were still really good. Everybody said, no, no, on stage he he was still great. So, um, yeah, that, that's really, it's, it's impressive that no matter what, his artistry would always be in full force. I want to ask you the Joan Brothers did, because, like, oh, go ahead, go ahead. We it, 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 uh, this, is, this is Kevin. Our, our, our connection is really breaking up. I, I'm calling you in on my cell phone. How much you can cut over? Okay, okay, that'd be fine. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna take a. Uh, this is great uh, time to take a break uh, because I'm gonna play. I want to play some of Willie John songs, and we're gonna work on our community. I definitely got some questions to ask the John brothers. I want everybody to hear them loud and clear. So since we're on the talk show, and since one of my favorite Willie John songs is uh, you, everybody don't talk to me, right? <laughs> everybody, I think everybody oh, yeah. loves that song. It's a great song. I've been on it. Ever since I found out about Willie John, I, I play it almost every day. So I'm going to play Talk to Me, and we'll be right back. All right. And we all be radio. And that was Talk to Me by the late, great Little Willie John. And to me, I, when I read the book Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and The Birth of Soul, it's like every great singer and music genius who was, who, who was and, and is a big fan of Willie John, Pick that song as their favorite, 
And I'm, I'm trying to move in with the John brothers and Sister Susan Whito, who are the co-authors of Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and The Birth of Soul. Like, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, All right, great. You're clear now. All right, this is better because we got some, we got to get some great questions. A lot of people on the line waiting to talk to y'all. Talk to y'all. I just talked to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I want to ask y'all, what is it about that song in particular that people like Stevie Wonder and others really find very attractive? And BB King. You said what? Wait, say it again. What is it about the song "Talk to Me" that other musicians find very attractive? Well, you know what? I think it's it's got to be the melody. Uh, and if they heard my dad's version of it, I mean, the way that he just really absorbed himself in a song, mm-hmm. it was like, you know, you could you could feel what he was saying. And it's a, it's a great song. The song was written by Joe Seneca, who was also an actor. I know a lot of people remember him from a movie called Crossroads with, with the guy from The Karate Kid, uh, oh, yeah, Ray Machaccio mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. A great movie. He was a great actor. And I got a chance to meet him. Um, before he passed, uh, when I was at the uh, premiere for uh, a movie, I did a, a song in the soundtrack called School Days, and Ooh. he was there. And uh, when he met me, he was all excited and everything. And he was telling me uh, about how much he loved my father and my father's voice and how that my father recording that song saved saved him as a songwriter. Wow. You know, made a lot of people, you know. And then, and then after he recorded it, a whole lot of other people recorded it. But but basically, the way that my father, the way that he, um, the way he really put his, put put all of him into into his songs, mm-hmm. and the fact that that song happened to be so melodic, that's probably a reason that it's been one of one of the more recorded songs, re-recorded songs of uh, that that my father had done. And, and you know, Ron, too, um, many people don't know that Susan and I were talking about this some time ago. The Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, also recorded that song. She liked that oh. song a lot too. You know, I don't think yeah. she officially recorded it. She, but she I saw it on, on one. Of, if you look at the discography, I saw it on one of her uh, on one of the albums. Okay, great. Yeah, because I know she loved it and played it, and you can find it. At, there's a YouTube video of her playing it from a TV show. Oh wow! Yeah. She just does a beautiful job. That, that I think that's definitely her favorite song of Willie's as well. And uh, yeah, I I just like. And there's something it. that oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I just want to put in a pitch for it. I, I think um, the feeling that, that you feel from that song, it's ultra romantic. It's just so, mm. lu- so lush, a ballad. It is. I mean, I just, I'm just i really moved by it. And also, Fever, which I understand from the book, your father, I mean, Willie John did not really care about that, that song, Fever, at all. But he made it at defensive first he did. They, they, had to, they had to convince him to record the song. <laughs> I think he liked it afterwards. But. I don't think he did. I mean, it's a quite, I mean, like it, I, I can see why it's very. It got great response from people. It still does get a great response to this day. I know I really enjoy it. But I, I, why I think about Willie John is the fact that he was the friend of the of the struggling songwriter to me. He's kind of like Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday could take any material in her oh, prime yeah. and make it like a, a oh, hit. Yeah. And he knew how to sell a song, man. It would be yeah. up to me, and it stays in your head, man. I can see. I can, yeah. and, and, and Willie's brother had said, you know, they would they would give them this dub, a songwriter's dub, and, it, and they would sometimes sound pretty funky. You know, they it just wouldn't sound like much. So he had to take that and and make it into a song, make it into something you really wanted to hear. And I thought that's like taking a song somebody just wrote that's like a it's like a demo. It's like a demo, and and. Um, taking somebody's song that's like a demo and making it sound like a record. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's a professional. <laughs> Your dad was a consummate professional. There's no doubt about that at all. And I got, I want to get in some uh, people that's been waiting patiently to talk to you all. This one sister, uh, she's a great freedom singer uh, from the great state of Mississippi and also civil rights veteran, Sister Margaret Block. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just now, fascinated. Welcome to Oh, thanks. I'm just fascinated just to even hear somebody that know about, that to hear about Little Willie John, because people don't know about Little Willie John. And especially those, like, 35s and back, they don't, they've they never heard of Little Willie John. And just yeah. listening to Talk to Me and then Fever, I mean, you know, and just, I've been humming Fever all day when Ron told me that you were going <laughs> to be on. 
because that was my jam. My mom, let me tell you why. I like Fever. We had a little club we could go to. I think that was the song we I was dancing off when my mama caught me up in the club dancing when I was supposed to have been at choir. Uh oh. And <laughs> gave me Uh-oh. a oh it well. Anyway, it's just an honor to talk to you to because he was your father. Yeah. Kevin. Was he dad? was your father. Yes. He must have had a fascinating yes. childhood with a father like little Willie John. He was the character. He was a lot of fun. He he loved us though. He and, and people talk about things that he would do. You know, he was a character and stuff. But to to us, he was just dad. But he, we sang around the house a lot. Yeah, that's what we did. We sang. We didn't have a TV, so we sang a lot. Listen to the radios. Oh, okay. So you guys provided your own. Uh, you you provided your own in-house uh, entertainment, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dad or nothing. You know, yeah, one, one we wait till well, we had music. We wait till my mama would go to church, and my daddy would put the music on, and we dance up a storm until it was time for her to come home. We'd cut the music off and act like we hadn't done nothing. But it's that kind of thing. I don't. Hmm? I I think people people it's so cool that people your age do not forget Willie. They just have such a affection for him and that song and his music. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah I go with George well, Taylor a lot, and I've been finding old records. I'm gonna keep my eye out for Little Willie John. because oh. oh. I found I Wilson I Pickett the other day. I just had a guy call me and want to know how he could get hold of some stuff because obviously he'd let his records go years ago of Willie. Mm-hmm. So he wanted to know where can I buy a CD? Where can I get it? So yeah, that, that's sort of a two pronged thing. When people read the book, they want to hear him, which is great. That's right. That's right. And it's, yeah. a, lot, it's a lot more of a it's a lot more of the music uh, of, that's available uh, via the internet. And uh, I'm not sure about iTunes. Is, is Kevin, is some some of the stuff is. They, they, you might find a little bit on iTunes, but it, it's a lot if you if you just Google his name and then Amazon dot com. Amazon dot com has mm-hmm. we know they have a, 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 at least a couple of the uh, um, old old albums. Oh, four or five of them. Okay, four or five of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And, uh, so that's the place to go. You don't have to look too far. <laughs> oh, I guess so. no. I, what I mean, I like to collect old vinyls. Oh. Oh, I see. So that means yeah, that's what old, I collect. That means you got an old vinyl record player, huh? Uh, yeah, I have one, vinyl. but I'm, I sell them on eBay. You can find them on eBay, yep. I say I sell yep. them on eBay. Mm-hmm. It's a little business. Mm-hmm. It's my friend and I have. But I look out okay. for old vinyls anyway. I, I'm a historian, so I try to say stuff like that so my grandchildren will know what a record is and what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, because if you ain't got none of that, it's hard to explain it to them, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They say, a what? A record? What? I, I, I think the sound is better. One of my little cousins I, I, had my record out there one day, thought it was a Frisbee. They were throwing records. Uh, <laughs> like it was a Frisbee. You're kidding me. Uh, well, I want to ask uh, the, uh, the John brothers this, like, did you actually understood the importance of your father to, like, music history and to his uh, industry. Like, I know I, I saw an interview with one of the Thelonious Monk's kid uh, said that he could understand why people was all hanging around his father, like Miles Davis and uh, Sonny Rogers, like they were little kids. And, like, when he played Happy Birthday, it sounded terrible when they was kids. So looking back on hindsight, they understood the importance. Or, like, uh, when Andy Warhol brothers, when they went to his funeral, they, just, they didn't see see that brother this world, you know, internationally known artist. They saw this little Andy into the front row. I want to know, did y'all understand the importance and the, and the greatness of your father? Well, you know, Ron, this, this is Kevin. I, I didn't really appreciate it when he died, but some years later I began to appreciate it when we would be performing and we would meet people like the OJs. I remember one of the things that he said the ver- very first time I met him. He said to me and my brother, he looked at me, he said, man, your father was one of the greatest. And when Eddie Levert said that, because my brother and I were growing up and we were performing, Eddie Levert and the OJs were like, they were like the Beatles to us back then, you know. And so when Eddie Levert said that, we began to get the point. And then other people would tell us that. Uh, we had a chance to perform with, with uh, Joe Tex to open for him. 
And I was telling Joe Tex how much I loved uh, Johnny Taylor. He said, man, Johnny Taylor loves your dad. Yeah. So we began to see through other people's eyes and Levi Stubbs, you know, people that we knew. Right. And then, and then, yeah, yeah. And I remember, I remember uh, uh, we, were, uh, we were traveling. We, we, we went to Chicago with, with Kim Weston. Um, who's a very good friend of my family, and and, and uh, hey Kim, she, and and she uh, introduced us to Red Fox, and he said, "Y'all can't sing, I'm nothing," because he respected my dad so much. He's like, the way your daddy could sing, y'all gotta have a little smidgen of that, or, or something like that, wow. right? He said, "Y'all can't sing, I'm nothing," and 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 uh, and of course, and and Jesse Jackson, who's not in the entertainment business, right. but but has been. Has been around a lot of incredibly talented uh, entertainers and stuff. Was telling me some things about him. He calls me Little John now when I see him. He calls me Little John because right. he lo- he loved my dad and he respects him so much. And and he was telling me how woo your daddy boy your daddy was something else you know. Oh yeah. He he sang a couple of Willie songs in in front of me. Um, to- <laughs> how about that? Oh he did. He did. See, well, I didn't he do him justice. He embarrassed himself. I know you're a great speaker and all, but he he, 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 hey, he wasn't that brave in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't dare. Oh, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't that brave in front of me. No way. But I mean, you know, it, it, we we learned we learned the, the 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 impact that my father's gift had on so many people from uh, when we were growing up, like. I remember the first time I heard LTD's Love Ballad. I said, wow, who is that guy singing that song? And then, and then later, fast forward years later, uh, one of our best friends uh, of the family is, is Jeffrey Osborne. And, so, and to learn from him how, much, how he, when I met him, he got upset with me because I didn't tell him I was Little Willie John's son. I just introduced myself as Keith John, and he didn't make the connection. And then I saw him after he did his performance, and I was like, man, that was incredible. And he gave me a dirty look, and I said, what? What's wrong? And he said, how come you didn't tell me little Willie John was your daddy? He said, that was my idol. And so he was actually mad at me because of that. I mean, not a real hard mad, but, you know, he was disappointed. He was like, hey, how come you didn't tell me about that? Well, I had no idea. And then he started singing, one, he started singing Let Them Talk, one of my father's songs, you know. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and just to, and just to show that we've come full circle, just this past summer, he was performing here at a local venue, and uh, I had spoken to him before the show just briefly, and he got up there on the stage in front of all the people there. He started talking about Lou Willie John and about the book, and how Lou Willie John was his idol. He said, "If you like, if you like my steps, you know, I learned them all from Lou Willie John." So it was it was a nice shout out from somebody, and that's the thing that we appreciated even over the, all the years. The artists have not forgotten. Yes. They have not forgotten his talent, and that, that's really CBT that's encouraging for us. And every time we see people, every time we see people like George Benson, and and and, and every time I see, uh, well, I see Stevie too often for him to say something about him every time. But we just did we just did a concert in where where, where was I, Kevin? Brazil? Uh, in Brazil? We no, are. no, no. The the song before that, uh, the the gig before that, we were in a, we did Austin City Limits in Austin, Texas. Uh, right outside of Austin, and and uh, uh, Stevie started playing uh, Fever, and I and I stepped up, and 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 he he started talking about my dad a little bit, and I stepped up and I sang the song, and and we had a good time, and you know that's the interesting yeah. thing about working with Stevie, though you never know what he's gonna do before he does it. You know what? <laughs> so you have to always be ready. <laughs> right, right, I'm, I'm, but he I'm, loved my dad, and I'm, and George Benson too. I'm sorry, go ahead. Kevin. No, no, you said George Benson. I've got a great George Benson uh, story. It's part of it is in the book. Uh, not long before we were finished, Susan and I were talking. George Benson called me from uh, New Zealand mm, one right, evening. Right. He called me from New Zealand on the night he had a show just to talk so that we could get, you know, the input that we wanted from him in the book. And I thought that was really a nice tribute, you yeah. know, to be that far away on the other side of the world. I, and, I, and I don't usually, I don't usually pat myself on the back, but I, I kind of set that up because a friend of mine told me. He was get he was gonna see George later that night, and I said, "Listen, we need to talk to George. Tell him to ask him to call Kevin or call Keith John." And he called Kevin from after he left Australia. The next stop was New Zealand, and he called him. I never got to hear that 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 uh that whole story, but I, I'm sure when we get off the phone, he's gonna have to tell me because. But but um, it, it was it was very nice of him to do that, and that shows the love and respect that he had for my dad as well, because. When you're on tour, it's so much going on. It's so easy to overlook things, you know. Not not because you try to, but just because everybody is is, is talking in your ear from all these different, you know, directions. Right, exactly. 
And you know, you know, so, lot, so, lot, but. That, exactly yeah. what, what Keith's saying. These guys are so busy on the road, but because musicians had such respect for Willie, like B.B. King, it was the same thing. Wow. I, he doesn't give interviews if he's got a sold out show. He doesn't have to. But when I said it for a book about Little Willie John, that changed it. Then he said, okay, he would do a story, he would do an interview. And mm-hmm. that, it's just amazing. He just totally opened up. All he would talk about was Willie, though. That's all. And uh, that's, you know, how deep an impression he made as a friend and as a fellow artist over mm. all those years. And, you know, one, one of my favorite conversations, and Sue, you and I talked about this, was the conversation with the Iceman, with, with Jerry Butler. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. He was, he, was, he was very, very nice and so warm, oh. you know, and so so accommodating, you know. And he just had nothing but nice things to say. And, of, of course, a lot of that is in the book, you know. But yeah. just, just, yeah. just the out, the outpouring of of affection from these people who you know who don't have to do this, and right. you know that that list goes on and on because it, there were people that we didn't even have a chance to to get to 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 interview uh, and stuff for the book. Uh, I remember we we went to one of Jeffrey's concerts that that he was doing. They do this four man thing where they call themselves the, the men, men of soul, soul right? And it's Jeffrey right. Osborne, oh. Peppa Bryson, mm. uh, Freddie Hewitt. Jackson, and Howard Hewitt. And after the show, we mentioned my dad's name, and Tebow Bryson just started talking and talking and talking. I remember uh, I, when I spoke to the Whispers a while back, they told me they used to sneak in these different theaters and stuff to see my dad perform. Because yeah. they were old enough to be there. And somebody else told me they used to, it was another artist that told me they, that he used to sneak into these different theaters and different places. He, they used to find out where my father was playing, and they used to sneak in because some of them were too young to... to uh, to uh, to be there to be yeah. there, and, but they find a way to get in because you know you don't want to miss this. If if this is what you want to do, if music affects you the way music affects my brother and I, you know you don't want to miss things like that. You know, yeah, and so good. so they would do what they had to do to to get in there. And also I heard uh, I had a, a story given to me by Frankie Beverly, by 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 uh, Patty Labelle. These things didn't make the book, mm-hmm. you know. But they but, will. But, been, they will. Hey, because you didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll, I'll, go ahead, they'll, they'll, make, they'll make it for the next edition. I mean, Aretha. <laughs> we tried to get to. A, I tried to get to Aretha, and mm-hmm. you know how it is with some publicists that you just don't get through. Right. But she found out about the book because she read about it in the Detroit News, my newspaper, where mm-hmm. we had an excerpt from the book. So she, when I was talking to her for a story, she she said, you know, I saw that thing you did on Little Willie John. And I said, actually, that's from a book I did. And uh, she goes, there's a book about Little Willie John? I have to get that book. I'm like, geez. So she gave me some great quotes that we can put in the book, and, you know, she talked about them. And, and you know, Jeffrey Osborne, we really, we really need to get some of his stuff in the next edition as well. So y'all go do an updated version of the book. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. like it's, oh, yeah. it's incredible. I mean, the love. I mean, like these people just like they were waiting for this book to come along. I mean, it seemed like they were because, like you said, a lot of these folks don't give interviews, and it's hard to get in touch with them. But the well, fact that they're so candid. It almost. Seemed, you know, it's interesting too. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sue. Well, I was just gonna say it almost seemed. I almost felt embarrassed for a while. There was just like so much. It's like it's just overkill because we had so many great quotes from so many great musicians over and over and over. But no, it's not overkill. It was all from the heart, you know. Yeah, and even even years ago, when people first found out that we were working on this project, I'm talking about more than five years ago. Mm-hmm. People would email people would email us, you know, when is this is coming out? When can, when can I get it? You know, wow. and we wow. were and we had really just started the project. And I'm not talking about entertainment now. I'm just talking about people that wanted to read about who, what happened because what happened to your dad? What you know? What happened? Well, the book is going to reveal all that. So people were really anticipating this, and we it it kind of took me by surprise. I have to say. You know, what, what, one thing that surprised me, it always surprises me what people don't know. It, you know, over the years, there, there are details of that, did, that got lost and all that. Mm-hmm. I was telling Kevin, that, um, Bob Skaggs, the singer, I, he, got, he wanted a copy of the book very badly. He was a big fan of Willie's, and uh, he, he started to read it. He, he read about three-quarters of the way through and emailed me. He didn't know that Mabel John was Willie John's sister. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's hilarious. I, I mean, that. I was, I mean that's, a, that's a lot of talent in one family. I mean, y'all, I mean, I'm just thinking that y'all got two like, you know, iconic, you know, uh, artists in y'all family, and 
I know in the book made like interest comparisons between the Johns and the Jacksons. I thought, wow, that's very interesting. It kind of makes a lot of sense. Like, I mean, how do y'all view that? I mean, you see your father like the uh, precursor to Michael uh, Jackson. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. By by way of by way of James Brown and and Jackie Wilson, all these people that 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 shaped and molded uh, uh, Michael were were big fans and 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 highly influenced by my father. You, you know, know it's, it's interesting you mention that too because I had a gentleman I spoke to just earlier this evening. Uh he emailed me and I and I I responded to him. He used to be a promoter years ago and he promoted some shows for James Brown and he he told me some of the things that James said about my dad. You know, so it's interesting mm-hmm. and hopefully he's listening to the show he said he would be. Oh. His name is Jim um Boulder Boulder Book. Oh, and okay. uh and he does he does um music reviews and he does book reviews and so so hopefully he's listening and he says he's going to do a real nice review for the book so it's, it it never stops it's just a continuous thing now mm-hmm. Ron you mentioned the thing about the Jacksons I think I agree with, with Keith I mean the Jacksons obviously were talented for a long period of time but everybody has to have someone that they influences them and clearly Michael even said as a child that James Brown influenced him and I know that Willie John had a big influence on James Brown. And Jackie exactly. Wilson. And, yeah. Exactly. In fact, many people don't know this. They'll know when they read the book. James Brown, early in his career, he opened at the Apollo for my dad. So he was the opening act. Yeah. And, you know, when I, there's a quote in the book. It was actually someone at King Records, one of the musicians, said that, you know, whenever Willie came down to do a session in Cincinnati, he always had family with him. He'd have Murtis, he'd have... Um, you say you'd have somebody, and it, it was like that family. They're like the Jacksons, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there was always a bunch of Johns around, you know. Yep. And also, I got parallels between the Cook family too, coming I mean, because the gospel background. Yeah. I mean, they were singing. I mean, like it was yeah. amazing, like how. I mean, you know what's said though when I think about those times, and you know, people are always talking bad about Joe Jackson Senior and all this other stuff. And I'm saying, like those different times, you actually had. In spite of your of your family coming out the cardboard valley, I believe the the project of Detroit, mm-hmm. you actually had a family, and that's missing right now. You had a a mom and a father, and you had you know, you had love in the house from what I can get. What your mama talk about, you know, being a part of that family, being accepted by the family, and being embraced in love. You had a loving family. I know the father, the elder Stephen, might have been a little bit strict. But I always say when we have Willie John, it was for the father. Mm-hmm. They strictly you know, have I, Michael I, I, without Joe. I can I can't agree with it. I, I, and, I, and don't get me wrong. I mean, because I'm, I'm a father of, of two grown young men now, and I don't mm-hmm. believe in abusing anybody. But I think um, things are a lot different than they were now. And, but even Michael Jackson, I, I'm not I'm not an expert on him, but he said without his father being the way he was, he would never have been the person that he is. Mm-hmm. And I remember my grandfather a little. But I really remember my grandmother, my my father's mom, and she was really a, a rock, and she was really she was strict. I mean, even on our, on our, the grandchildren, you know, we had to be in, you know, when the street lights came on, you know, right. you know, unless someone was out with us. So that was just it was just the times. But I think mm-hmm. the people grew up with responsibility and more responsible, you know, as a result of that. You know, and Jermaine Jackson just said in his book, in his memoir, mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of the same thing. Uh, he really didn't think his father um, was going overboard because of the, the the atmosphere that they grew up in. He really thought he was keeping them safe, keeping them from the street and everything. And keeping them focused as well. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, I re- I remember yeah some of the stuff that Kevin was talking about. I remember one one incident in particular where I I was uh, playing uh, with fire uh, matches and uh, almost burnt my grandmother's house uh, down. And uh, yeah, I deserve what I got. <laughs> and, and and you know what? When we were kids, we 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 never thought of that as abuse. We thought of that as what they used to call rearing, rearing your child. You know, to raise your child, you got you you know you have to. You got to discipline them when they step out of line, and then and then they don't want to step out of line. Yeah. But I mean, you, you know, but the thing that's got to be that you always do it out of love. It's never out of absolutely. Um, it's never anything harsh. You do it because you love them and you want to guide them the right way. Mm-hmm. Right, I never, it's never out of anger. Is what I'm exactly, to say. exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, I've got a call on the line. I've been waiting patiently. I, I, I believe they want to talk to y'all. Okay. Uh, let's see. This. 
Call Before they no say more. anything, remember, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Okay, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. All right. 704, you on the air? You want to speak to uh, the Johns and Sister Susan? 704? Hello? Is it, hello? You on the air? You want to talk? Are you there? Yes. I just said it's listening. A lot of times people would call on the show to listen. Mm-hmm. And, like, a lot of people are really enjoying this. But I just want to ask y'all, too, um, was it hard growing up as the son of little Willie John? I mean, it's kind of like you ask somebody, is it hard to be the son of Michael Jordan? Or is it hard to be the son of Picasso? Uh, was it hard well, like, if you want to decide to go into singing like y'all did? You know, well, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start first. I, 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 think, I think it's hard if you want to follow them in the same footsteps because people expect a lot. Now, it will get your foot in the door, but if you don't do something, your foot will be slammed in the door. So, you, yeah, a lot is expected, you know. So it, it's, it, it's, it's difficult. It makes you work hard. And, and, and my brother's still in the music industry, and he's extremely talented, you know. And so it makes you work hard. It gives you a work ethic that you might not normally have. You know what? I, I, I consider it being the son of uh, somebody as gifted as my father, and uh, I, I would consider it to be like the proverbial double-edged sword. The the on one side of that sword, people will will look at you and they'll they'll give you a look, they'll give you a listen. But on the other side of it, if you don't deliver the goods, they'll they're really quick to say, well, that that must have been a one one a uh, one one hit wonder more more or less. Uh, their father was the hit and they're the miss. So they they, they they you know they say that kind of stuff. Well, well, his dad their dad was good. You can't expect everybody to come after him to be like that. And I mean, I know, and I know, uh, my father was awful gifted. When people say, "Yeah, you sound like your daddy," or whatever, that to me that's just like a big compliment because my father, he was just, he was just amazing at what he did, and 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 that's yeah, we we look at that as a compliment. But I I must I must say that the the gift doesn't stop at us. My brother uh, Kevin has two sons, and 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 look out, you'll be hearing about them because they wow. uh, yeah, they're gifted too. Mm. Yep. It's well, sister, uh, sister Susan, from a writer's point of view, how has the the, the music genius that is Little Willie John? How is, how has he enriched your life? Oh well, I always say, you know, when when in terms of quality, we were talking about, you know, he set such a high standard in terms of being an artist and singing and all that that I wanted to make sure the writing was up to snuff. That it it kind of was a it was a credit to his story and to, you know, what an artist he was. Because, you know, I, I've read books before that were disappointing about artists I was really, I loved, um, singers that were great, but they just didn't get a great treatment in the book. They, the book was just written, you know, not, not very well, whatever. So there was always a quality thing over my head. I always thought, this has to be good because he was good. He would not give a subpar performance. So uh, you you have to look at it that way. You have to give people a, a great reading experience. And I have to say, if people get the book and read it, they they have almost all liked it, you know. So I really we really just uh, trying to get the word out as much as we can. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know in a lot of ways to me the title is misleading in terms of it's not a sensational. I mean, he had a you know he he he, you know, he got around like Tupac would say he got around. Mm-hmm. But you know, overall, it's like he was a good guy. He mm-hmm. just, you know, he was, he, was, he was caught up in a grown-up world. I mean, he was like a kid. I was, I people think of myself. This guy was even nineteen yeah. when he made like so many defining songs yeah. that influenced a generation of singers. And I'm just looking at the fact that this kid came out of Detroit. So it's kind of like Charlie Parker come out of Kansas City. Yeah. So you got all these saxophone players, and I mean, you're the best of the best, man. You be, you you the idol of Jackie Wilson and Levi Stubbs and. You know, James Brown make a whole tribute album to you, the Godfather of Soul, and right, you the, right. and you the one <laughs> out of everybody. Mm-hmm. And yet, like it's like in our country, we don't really appreciate the original. Mm-hmm. We exactly. don't really accept them. We like the carbon and, copies, but we don't accept the original. Oh, yeah, exactly. And 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 then you have you have a lot of uh, a lot of people that that, that come that come after after them, and those are the people who sometimes. Get the recognition, like yeah, you heard that song. And, uh, my my father was when he was young, and and and, and they hear this voice on the radio, and they say he, he, he's like, well, if I don't love you, baby, 
grips ain't groceries, eggs ain't poultry, and Mona Lisa was a man. And they don't rec- recognize that that was the first one that did it. They hear somebody, yeah. well, if I don't love you, baby, you know, and, and they, these songs get recorded over and over and over again, and the original one gets lost. And sometimes, as in the case of Fever, that was the best version. That was exactly. That was the version... The de- definitive version. That was the best version. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, it didn't get the crossover airplay. That's all. Yeah. But uh, I, I think too it was an accident of history. It's because you know he got caught up in a little bit of trouble and taken off the road just when music and soul was was exploding and crossing mm-hmm. over and exactly. was, Motown mm-hmm. was hitting, Stax was hitting, and mm-hmm. he he hit just before that. So. Yeah, man, man. Yeah. Opened a lot of those doors. I mean, but I just think about that. He made it without. I mean, he was. Barry Gordy was using his sister because he had no car to get around Detroit. <laughs> hey, yeah. but, but he was already getting stuff played on, on radio stations, and Barry Gordy was beg, begging him to, to take one of his songs off his hands. Yeah. I just see it's amazing that this guy, that just the sheer just tenacity and the, and the spirit of this cat to make it. In a country, I mean, doing the, the tours down south. I mean, I'm in Memphis. I hear horror stories from old timers about how the South treated musicians of color mm-hmm. and to be mm-hmm. a person of color and to be brilliant. I mean, this guy was a, not only was he a great entertainer, but he was a student. He was a technician. He was mm-hmm. a scientist. I mean, he studied his craft. He honed it. I mean, he took the voice lessons. I mean, he did well in his studies, and he was not no, you know, he was not no pushover. I mean, he knew that he had value, and he knew that he was a true artist. Well, because so many people don't know that. I mean, it's like entertainers just look at themselves as being entertainers. But he knew he was an artist. You know what? Right, right. Talk, talking about how he studied and all that, too. A lot of people have pointed out the, the um, report cards that we had mm-hmm. in there. It's, he had a great report card at, at Pershing. He was a smart guy. I want to cut right quick, too. I'm glad uh, Brother John, he lead out with the All Around the World. Now, how old was Willie, little Willie John? This was like his first hit. How old was he exactly when he recorded this again? I believe that was 17, right, too? Yeah. He was a grown man at 17. <laughs> man, he was like, oh, wow. <laughs> just, that's amazing. Well, I'm going to play this, and we're going to get right back to it. I got some people on the line that want to talk. So we'll oh, get great. right into it. But all around the world, I want to see. I want to like people never heard of Willie John. A lot of cats that have been listening to my show, they don't know who he is. I just discovered the brother. So I mean, it's about educating people because I you know I hear a lot of times people get on shows and they don't really play the music or they just play a little snippet of the music. But to do the man just gonna play the whole thing is all around the world. A little Willie. Thank John. you. And that was all around the world in less than three minutes with brother Little Willie John. And this is the art of his. We All Be Radio, and of course tonight's show is Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and The Birth of Soul. That's the title of the new book and soon to be really, really best, best-selling book and feature-length movie sometime in the very <laughs> near future. And I'm on with brother, the John brothers, so the, uh, Keith and Kevin, and also Sister Susan, co-author of this wonderful book. I was like, man... That's how seventeen sounds, man. <laughs> that's a grown man. I, I, he played with cats that's like fifteen, twenty years older than him. And he sounds just as seasoned as those guys. <laughs> yeah. And matching them no for no court for court. He had been seen a long time. He started a long time before that. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, man. I just like wow. I just it blew him out because I really that gives me like the lyrics. I mean, he really just owned the song. Like he knows how to own it. He like he understands his voice like an instrument. You know, it's like he understands like a trumpet player understands that trumpet or a saxophone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he really understands like the detail of his voice. You know, you know, one absolutely. Of, it's, it's really too bad there isn't there isn't that infrastructure of you know um, oh, talent shows that they used to be in Detroit where mm-hmm. he honed his craft because he was he was out there doing it. Over and mm-hmm. over, you know, no one, no one had to play an audience, knowing all those different songs. He's so good. And 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 also his his gift was was organic. His gift was just mm-hmm. natural. And you know now nowadays it's like you have you have a lot of a uh, a lot of processed uh, singers where right. you know you you they got a good look and they can sing a little bit so. They they go into this artist development situation where you have a person that comes in and teaches them how to sing. Mm-hmm. Um, that that you know, 
he had that naturally. He, nobody had to teach him how to sing. I mean, if you take a class to teach you how how to to to, to lean a little more towards a particular style of music, it's one thing. Mm-hmm. But just to open his mouth and just sing and just make your your eyes water, make the hair stand up on your right. arm, you know, you to make you get that kind of feeling. That's organic, man. That's real. That's 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 natural. You know, mm-hmm. you just open your mouth and just make it happen. Not not know from the beginning. Where where are you going? But I always get there and land safe on everything that you know what I mean. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. so, so what, what was what was the quote? He, he he could sing anything. He could sing "Mary Had a Little Lamb" and make you cry while he's singing. Oh. <laughs> what, 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 what was that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly the phone book. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's in the phone book. Oh, Mary, 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 Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> wow, man! Of course, some, some crazy, some crazy stuff, you know. Oh, Mary, 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 Mary had a little lamb. Oh, that's beautiful, you know. man! Wow. I'm wow, just saying. Sorry. I'm just saying. Just open your mouth and don't think about what you're gonna do before you do it, and just do it. That's that's natural, man. It, yeah. you know, folks, you know, folks would kill to get to get that kind of stuff, and and he just had it natural. Just like Levi Stubbs, who was his his running buddy when they were kids, they just had that. You could just open your mouth up and just make people feel things, you know. And you that's that's what that gift is all about, you know, to touch people, inspire people, make them feel good. And you know, everyone I talked to heard him when he was still singing you know, in church, gospel right. with the family, said that he he never had that childlike sound. He always sounded, you know, mature. He always sounded. Um, you know, sure of himself, and he didn't have that kid-like um, little tiny Michael Jackson sound. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> well, right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just uh, when I'm thinking about that, I want to know how much y'all feel that that the how much the black church has played in the development of their singing style. I know it's natural, it's organic, but how I mean, I, I think about him and Sam Cooke and folks like that, Aretha Franklin, and they all came up in the in the church. And how how much has the church allowed him to cultivate his voice to the degree you believe? Well, I, I definitely feel like the the influence was there. Um, I know that 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 growing up, you know, they they had a, a spiritual background, but um, you know, it, it's not like I mean, he was such a a, a go getter that from the time that that he was old enough, I guess, to climb out of that window and go to that talent show, and he's like, you know, I'm I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this, you know. Because he was, they were, he they was raised and come from, as we talked about earlier, a strict, a strict home life, a strict background. But at the same time, he was stubborn and he was determined that he was going to do it on his own terms. So he would just, you know. So I think that I think that the influence of the of the of the church sound had a lot of more influence on him than the actual I'm learning while I'm in church kind of thing. Let me exactly. I I think you can uh, you can hear the, the I think the expression the expressiveness you know the mm-hmm. emotion I think he probably saw that and heard that and and that probably inspired him to infuse that into his singing a bit a bit mo- more but he was out there he was a little chameleon he was singing country he was singing big band he could do a lot of that any of that stuff mm-hmm. yeah I, I noticed that too that a lot of the kids are very versatile. Like that, they tend to have like they be like synthesizers. They can take everything and and just turn it out in their own voice. I mean, they take everything that's like a sponge, like you know, like you said, chameleon a sponge. They soak it all up. Like you know, I look at somebody like I guess back in the day. I, what I'm saying is, it's like you know, in order to make it, you really have to have a talent. I mean, because like you said, you got studio studio musicians, studio singers that got all this technology and stuff to uh, to make up these illusions. But back then, you really had to have a talent. Be able to cut it, you know, and I keep on thinking yep. about uh, that. This thing y'all, y'all talking about in the uh, book, the kind of remind me of uh, Ron Burgundy, the Anchorman movie, where all the the news folks came out to rumble, and it was the same thing I said about the gym. Uh, I think it was on North Side or whatever, and they had a gym. At the eight o'clock, somebody got a key and opened it up, and you had like sometimes you have anybody that came in town, and also the local grades come in. You had Levi, you had Willie Boss, you had Sam Cook and Jackie Wilson, they all coming in. And trying to out sing each other until like five o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I wish I had a, a video camera for that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, all these guys coming in and they just trying to out classic and all the other man. 
The guy that told but you me. know what? I, I I I think with my dad, I think his approach was different. He loved music. See, today they want to put music in all these categories. Right. Music is music. You know, if it's good music, yeah. it's music. Mm-hmm. So you know, country, uh, yeah. R and B, soul, pop, whatever you want to call it, it's all music. So yeah. if you look at it as music, if it's good music, he wanted to sing it. Right. Yeah, I, the thing that I find interesting in that in that same line is that that uh, uh, my father did a song called "She Thinks I Still Care." I, I just was going <laughs> to bring that up. <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Susan. I'll let I'll let no, you work no, it. Go finish, ahead. Finish, finish. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that uh, uh, music being music and people that appreciate music, they don't care where it comes from, what genre or what box you want to put it in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he heard my father my father's version of a song. That but that was uh, a country song, and he loved it so much he wanted to record it, and he Elvis did. He went Elvis on to record it. Elvis did, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, Elvis, you know, Elvis Presley. Who, everybody yeah, go ahead. Th- everybody thinks that Elvis did the song. She thinks I still care because George Jones did it first, the country singer, and then he heard mm-hmm. George's version. But no, we found out it was actually Willie John's version of a country song that Elvis heard and loved. Oh wow. And he he took got the single and put it up on the wall at Graceland, and I'd love I would love to see if it's still there. He put it up where he has apparently his own records and played it over and over, and loved it. And that's when he recorded it. Elvis did. I like that. See, you, you, you know, go ahead. no, no, you can, you can tell when an artist really has influenced. Uh, a period of time. You, you think about the Beatles. The Beatles were the biggest thing that ever hit here, you know, from England. Right. And yet, and yet, the Beatles loved the Motown stuff, but they also loved Willie John's music. The Beatles recorded a song that Willie John did back, you know, in the in the early uh, '60s. I'll uh, leave my kid alone. That he uh, also wrote. Yeah, but now it was a different, and, and that's interesting too. To keep mention, it was a song he actually wrote. Also, he co-wrote. So it shows that there was something about that that they that they dug. I mean, you know, because the Beatles could sing whatever they wanted to sing, right? And and most of it they could write. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they and, and a lot of those songs and a lot of those songs though a lot of people don't they don't make the connection. A lot of those songs that they heard in their younger, more impressionable years influenced the writing of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. The Beatles. Come on, right. give me a break. You know. <laughs> exactly, and then. You say so you got t- two two titans of popular music, Elvis and the Beatles, both hearing Willie John records and and really digging it. Yeah, this is great. I mean, what, well, actually, I just I think that's fascinating. I brought the Beatles and Elvis Presley, especially the Beatles, because from my understanding, you know, Willie John took over the uh, the upset of got the Little Richard found religion, and that worked out well. But what thing about Little Richard was when he went over to England and whatnot. He had both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones open for him when they didn't have any, you know, a dime or whatever between them, mm-hmm. living out their cars and whatnot. And then I know when uh, somebody asked D.B. King what he thought about the Beatles, he said all they did was reimport the blues because the blues musicians <laughs> used to go over there all the time. And, they, you know, John Lennon and all them guys be sitting around them in Piccadilly Square mm-hmm. asking Willie Dixon and all these guys both daily questions about blues. And yeah. I just think it's strange. I, I think it's strange because I think, it's weird that, you know, Rolling Stones get their name from a Muddy Wilder song. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, one of the first places they want to go to Chicago to find these blues musicians. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, if Willie John was white, he would have been bigger than Elvis. He would have been bigger than the Beatles. I just think that's an insult. You know, because they got it from him. I mean, like, they, they can't, like Solomon Burke said, you got the original, but you can't accept the original. You got Winoni Harris, but you can't accept Winoni Harris. He's not even a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Roy Brown, oh, not even a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. You know, yeah. Otis Blackwell's connection between Willie John and Elvis. What, right. What, what's really ironic, too, is that the British invasion kind of buried a lot of acts like Willie. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. those, those guys love that music, though. Mm-hmm. They, and, and, you know, the Brits really have been supportive of Willie's music over the years. Absolutely. And, and to, to this day, to this day they, play, they play that stuff to this over day. and over. They oh, wow. Say, yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. And, and you know what's interesting, too? I mean, cut you off, Sue. Ron, the, the thing that's interesting, too, is right now, Lou Willie John's music sells better in England and yeah. in Europe and in yeah. Germany than it does in the U.S. Now, we don't educate our people. I mean, they're not, well, I, mean they're, I'm not, I didn't know about Willie John until a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the I feel cheated. Do. I feel cheated. The Brits do. <laughs> they do, but, yeah. but you know they know the real. It's like they were the first ones to write about jazz and take it seriously. 
Yeah. I mean, like, but you know, okay, and, and, uh-huh. and here's an interesting side point too, Sue. So think about this now. We're writing this book about a U.S. artist, mm-hmm. and who publishes the book? A, a British publisher. Mm-hmm. Wow. You, you see, so they appreciate they appreciate the talent. They appreciate the music. They appreciate the story. Mm-hmm. Because remember, Sue, they they were excited as anybody about this book. Well, yeah, yeah. we we were actually um, talking to American publishers. They were the they had already made an offer, and it's like, okay, well, let's just wait. Let's just wait and see. Mm-hmm. And it was like, no, no, us, us. They wanted to be the ones to publish it, and they it turned out that that's who we did go with. But um, you know, they were really anxious from the beginning to do that. Excited, yeah. Yeah. And uh, to them, to the Brits, this is like a, a you know, an R&B singer, American, mm-hmm. who's been unjustly forgotten. Oh yeah, done. But yeah. again, too, they they too they, they do have a big audience over there, and as Kevin was saying, his his CDs still sell over there. So exactly. Well, it's not a big and you know what? I, I think I think as a family, when you when you talk about releasing something of this magnitude, you want to go with the publisher that is the most excited to get it out there. You got to, exactly. you know, because because they become a part. It becomes a part of them, and they want to they want to put it out there. They want to see it do well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel it's an investment in it, definitely. And you know, they they put yeah. more pictures in the book than oh um, yes than you see in American books. Yeah. Can, so t- tell tell them what what our agent told you yeah. about the book. And the our our agent, you know, he handles a lot of music books, and he said we have I think three sleeves inside of of pictures. That, mm-hmm. That's unheard of. Um, American mm-hmm. U.S. published books will have two tops, but nobody has three. Mm. Right. They they just did that right. for pictures, and in this case, it was important I think because. Over the years, people have seen the same two or three pictures of Willie over and over. And we have some great pictures from the family and from other sources. And and when people read the book, they always say, I mean, once they get into the book, they're into the book. But when they first look at it, the first thing they always say is, wow, wow, look at those pictures. pictures. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I I, I did look at the pictures. As an artist, I love the color pictures. I mean, it 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 makes me such a, I mean, he's an icon. But it shows the human side to him, and also I, I love the fact that some of the sensationalism was was balanced out with some, you know, intimate portraits of of, of the man as a family man, and he was so, really protective of, of women and also of his family. It's only the truth. I mean, it's mm. uh, it's it's what was it's what's there. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You have to tell the whole story. You have to tell right. all of this aspects. When people see that one picture of. Willie and Darlin and the two boys, mm, toddlers. Yeah. That's the one that always amazes them because it's such a normal family picture, you know, like anyone would have. And it's like, well, yeah. why, is it, why is that so unusual? Of course, he had a family. <laughs> but you know, but the, the, my thing about it is being an entertainer and life on the road for an entertainer. You know, they, you know, there's a lot of one night stands and a lot of ways you can look at that. You know. I, right, about, right. I, had, I had a chance to interview Johnny H. family. You know, he's another unsung guy. He kind of reminded me, him and Willie John, in, in, the, in the fact that they opened the doors for so many people. Right. And pioneers. I mean, so many people had to ride their coattails, but they got buried in all the dust in terms of, you know, recognition from their from their peers and from the institutions that control, you know, the politics of the game. But uh, I, it's just like, you know, he was non-existent. For the most part, it's reading about me as being the fact that he he, it's like he was a committed family man. The fact that, you know, my understanding, when no kids did one night as back in the day, sometimes they might have to drive several hundred miles between shows. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's, that's, I mean, he was like, basically, he made his money on the road. And that's Because he wasn't getting that much out the rackets. And that's before, right. the, inter- that's before the interstate. Period. Exactly. That's crazy. That's, man, I, was, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of love and commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Feel proud. Yeah, it's probably a lot of praying too, because a lot of the towns and stuff that you have to go through. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, we want to talk about that. I want to take a break. Cause y'all brought up, you know, y'all bring it up on. Y'all know how to cue it. I want to play "Leave My Kids Alone" so people can understand how that might influence the Beatles and all these other groups and stuff like that. And then we'll get back and we want to talk about like you just brought up, like the dangers of the road, uh, how your how your father, how the subject of this book, Little Willie John, got in trouble. And also his legacy. All right. All right. And that was Leave My Kid Alone by the late great, but always present, Little Willie John. 
and this is We All Be Radio. We are talking about Fever, Little Willie John, A Fast Life, Mysterious Death, and the Birth of Soul, with Sister Susan Widow, and also the John Brothers, Kevin and Keith. Be very uh, grateful and uh, passionate and committed sons of the late, great Little Willie John. So I want to talk to you about, you know, you talked about troubles on the road and how what happened to your father back in uh, in the mid-60s, right? When his career was about to, you know, you know, he got about to get try to get into capital racket. Uh, but let's just back up to like what happened to get him in jail. Well, so, well, before it even got to that, I mean, I, I think you have to look at the the stuff that was happening. Like he lost the upsetters, you know, and uh-huh. and and stuff like that was going on. And plus, King Records sort of had a death grip on him, and that whole issue with his contract was really bumming him out. You know. Is it, it seemed like he could never get anything. He could never get any traction in terms of having having a you know, new music come out that that was really good mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah, and this all kind of the scenario has to be painted. What was going on in his life, and then then you know, uh, as this one musician told me, who knew him up in Seattle. There was a, just a series of really bad breaks and bad decisions, and boom, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Right. You know, too, and, and Ron, he was at a stage in his life too where he had, you know, he was a veteran to the uh, to the to the business, mm-hmm. and he wanted to start having some more control over what he was doing. And as Susan mentioned, King wasn't the place to get it. You know, you think about the uh, you think about the Marvin Gaye's, the Stevie Wonders. They right. have their hits, and then they they mature, and then they want to start doing their own thing, or at least having some control over what they're doing. And he never really got that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was, James it was, Brown had to do with King. You know, he had to basically leave King, and um, you know, he had to make demands, and and just to keep him, they let him do what he wanted, but. Yeah, you, know, you really. King was sort of going downhill as well because Sid Nathan was on his last leg. So mm. there, it just was like a, a series of calamities. He was tied to this record company that was dying, but still had a death grip on him. And uh, the gigs were getting smaller and a little scrappier. Um, I think at that point, even Mabel was booking him. And uh, so then, you know, you want to go to a party and forget about the gig, and boom. Wrong guy's following you around, picks a fight, he's twice your size. And the prosecutor who prosecuted Willie even said if the defense attorney hadn't been a drunk, perhaps he would have had a, a decent defense, Which you know, one of which could have been size. Someone that big attacks you, you've got the right to defend yourself. There were several viable options that the defense attorney could have taken but didn't. And uh, there again, that was a bad, bad break to get that particular defense attorney. Um, and, and Willie and, and, and to be and to be in Seattle at that time too. That wasn't probably yeah. the best place to be. You know, yeah. I mean, when you think about you think about having in, in any type of trial, you know, having uh, a jury of your peers. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. and he really didn't have a jury of, of his peers at all. And then, and then, didn't didn't the judge say something like, uh, "We're going to take you off your feet for a while"? Yeah, we're going to make an example, make an example of you. Yeah, sure. we're going to take him off his feet for a while. Yeah, they thought he was just a little too cocky and needed to be taken right. down a peg or two. And then he, he but it was totally um, in, in ineffectual defense. Totally, a, a good lawyer should have walked him out of there, as the prosecutor said, and uh, gotten him probation. Something, and it was even. And then, of course, he was in there and was about to get out. He would have been paroled in July, and he died in late May. So, you know, and, and, and Ron, if, if I might, I'd like to interject just something um, mm-hmm. because we're talking we're talking about facts. I, I got a on on my dad on the Facebook page we set up for the book. I, I got a, a really uh, kind of an inflammatory uh, message from somebody because there was an article that talked about a tribute to Lily John, and somebody responded. They said, "A tribute to a murderer?" Question mark. You know, and I said, "Well." So, so, so I responded. I said, "Well, this is exactly the reason why we have the book because people don't have the facts right." I said, "If you want to go by the facts, he was actually con- convicted of manslaughter, not murder, and there, there is a difference." Mm-hmm. 
You know, so but, but no matter what you do, no matter what you say, people are gonna are gonna say what they will. But it's but but this is the reason for more than twenty years it's been just gnawing at me. You know, we have to get the facts out to people. They have to know. They can draw their own conclusions once they find out. But at least we have to put it out there. It, it just really profoundly it, uh, shocked me. Even though you know, talking to the family and getting the picture of of Willie is, is a little more well rounded than what you see. Than what you read about previously, but it still really shocked me that the prosecutor was so convinced that this was an injustice. That that really that that that's really saying a lot. And it, it's yeah, it's a shame that something can't be done in Seattle. You know. All right, it's, just, it's weird to me because I mean, what was disturbed to me that a person to me like that may go sound like he was a hothead, a, a mercurial. Uh, you know, like a strange temperament, but what I got from the book and from the people that actually knew him, that he was a very sensitive guy, a very deep, uh, thoughtful person, a very nice person. He didn't really get well, you, well, what, 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 you know, since you said that, Sue, can, can you relate, or you want me to do it, relate what, what Jerry Butler said about um, my, my dad and my mom, that, that story. Do you remember that story that you, that you have in the book? Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he said that he was... He was always a gentleman, and he said what really impressed him was how kind he was in terms of um, Jerry was not doing as well as Willie was at that point. His group wasn't as important. He didn't have as much money. Right. And uh, he would always be on the on the lower end of the bill, whatever. And um, Willie was, they were going out one evening, he they and their wives, and Willie said, well, where's your wife's fur coat? Because, you know, in the 50s, you had to have a fur coat. Uh-huh in that realm of the music business. And he said, well, she doesn't have one. And he goes, what? So he he said, uh, darling, give her one of your coats. So that's what they did. They gave his wife, Jerry's wife, one of darling's fur coats to keep. Mm, wow. <laughs> he just he didn't want her to feel um, underdressed or not fitting in and wanted her to feel happy. And it mm-hmm. was very kind of him. He never forgot that. And I thought I was disturbed the fact when I saw like you know, James Brown, who was one of his good friends and one of his admirers, visiting him in jail in Walla Walla, Washington. Yeah. And he was in a wheelchair, and now, you know, he said he won't leave unless horizontally, meaning yeah. that he was going to yeah. die in prison. But, I mean, I just get, I just think that it's like, and obviously y'all got the report from them, and they didn't even have an autopsy report in it. Any uh, uh, documents y'all got? You know, they said they perform an autopsy. Well, well, you know, you're talking about late 1960s, you know, papers. Are right. Kept- that long, and uh, it, it was really, really difficult to fi- for them to find anything. And of course, at the time, they might they might very well have destroyed some of it. But exactly. See, and we're talking. We're talking. See, now this is 2011. We're talking computers on every people on every person's desk. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't have all that stuff back then. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking right now. You know, we're we're tying into you tonight, Ron. Via people are listening via the web. Right. What, is, right. what was the web in the 60s? You know, it didn't, <laughs> well, it didn't exist. Idea, right. not, exactly. not even a phone. <laughs> right. Yeah, and we're literally talking drawers, you know, papers that were in drawers. So um, I, one thing that I was really glad I did get that was the police report, the unexpurgated one. They, the mm. Seattle police didn't want to give that to anybody for years. <laughs> wow. And it was, you know, it was very eye-opening. It was really helpful to see all that. That and um, Kim Field was a great help. He had done a story for the Village Voice in the early 90s, and he interviewed people out there, and he was actually the one who put me in touch with the prosecutor. And Kim, Kim was a great guy, and it was a great story, and he didn't want Willie forgotten, and he thought that it was a mystery what had happened out there, and he wanted to try to get to the bottom of some of it. So, but it's like it was foul play, I mean, from what I get that, you got to fight with somebody. I mean, I mean, are y'all interested in like? I know this is you know, a touchy subject, but yeah, yeah, we gotta be willing if somebody steps in and do the uh, exhumation of your father's uh, remains to find out to do a proper autopsy. Well, you think? I think at this point it may not reveal a lot. I think maybe something that might be better was at the Innocence Project, where they go back and they do the they do the legwork and they go back and actually investigate to see what really could have happened. Mm-hmm. I you know, and, and as it relates to the the prison itself, I think that might be, you know, more uh, a more definitive uh, conclusion, you know, to, to find out what what happens because they they always look at people who were convicted to see if there was really evidence to convict to, to them. Convict them. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Yeah. And, also, well, and at this be- point, I think <clears throat> we're more <clears throat> being that it's, it's, it's probably it would probably be easier for us to find out. I mean, to clear his name uh, than it would be to find out what actually took place at at the prison around the time that 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 we lost him. You know, you know another thing too, Ron. I, I think it would that would be really, you know. You have to understand the process, you know, and I won't take all the credit because my brother and I both, you know, talked to my mom mm. quite a bit. But the process of getting her to even be able to go back to relive any of this, right. that that would be a bit too too painful, I think, for my mom to, to oh, the idea of yeah. you know rehashing that, especially something as serious as that, you know, yeah. you know having, you know, remains exhumed. I don't even think they'd be able to do anything now, even with the forensics that mm-hmm. they can do. Today, I don't think that that would be really beneficial, and it would be very difficult for my mom. Yeah, I think too. Uh, they can look into the the fact of the, the attorney being insufficient, and uh, I agree, not operating properly. They could. I agree. They could look at and and, and the procedures that took place, yeah. and if they did things correctly, and yeah. and even investigating what happened in, in in the prison because we had the prison records, and they talked about different incidents, different things that happened, and. And and the results of what happened. So I think that might be, you know, even more beneficial. There, yeah. were, letter, there were letters from other prisoners that were sent to um, Willie's wife, Darwin, mm-hmm. and that she turned them over to Mabel, who turned them over to Jesse Jackson. But it appeared that they were lost over the years, unfortunately. Mm. Wow, that's so wow. I mean, I guess they, on it. They basically revealed, you know, that he wasn't being treated properly. He was being his. His health was deteriorating, various things like that. I mean, cause he, had, he had epilepsy, right? I mean, he had epilepsy as well. Seizures, okay. But, yeah. It was some sort of, some sort of seizure disorder, yeah. And it was 1968. I mean, it was like when he was in prison after they killed Dr. King. <laughs> um, I, the, the climate of the time, I just think it's unfortunate. But it seemed like the way he died helps add to his legend. I know you lost a father and a family member. You know, he it helps as to his allure, his mystique, kind of like Robert Johnson or anybody of that caliber. I mean, the way he died, none of that. But then it's sad because I think a lot of ways, you know, the way he lives and the music should be better remembered. Like the artist. Well, we're, we're, we're hoping. Absolutely. We're hoping the book, you know, and, and, and the music and perhaps at some point, like Susan mentioned, a documentary, then maybe even a, a feature film. And people like you really help us to get the word. So we, we appreciate that too, Rob. And I mean, you know what I else I you want know. to say? Mm-hmm. You know what else I want to say before before uh, I lose the thought? Do we, uh, um, we recently went uh, to New York City, and uh, um, we did uh, a couple of radio things and, and a, a book signing there. And we got a chance to go to, to, to the Apollo and the... Uh, yeah. And we we really have to take our hats off to uh, uh, Catherine. What's her last name? Carol. Carol. Catherine Carol, because she really uh, looked after us while we were there, and uh, um, we got a chance to go to the Apollo. And you know how when you walk in and you're in the lobby area, they have this big collage of all the stars that have been there and everything. My right. brother is still at the top on the right to the right, and we got a chance to go and we took some pictures and we actually left a book uh, at the Apollo. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll get the message. We 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 think he deserves to be also in the Apollo Theater Hall of Fame. So, oh, yeah. um, he's at the so, very question, top. Right. He's at the very yeah. top of the collage. And as much as as much as they loved him at the Apollo, and the fact that my mom and my dad met each other at the Apollo, she was dancing at the time uh, with a dance company, and he was uh, performing there, and. Uh, they actually met at the Apollo Theater. So I guess you could say me and my brother are, are products of the Apollo. Yeah. <laughs> I know, roll down. I mean, it's like he had a love. I mean, say at the Hotel Teresa, he had a love for New York City. I mean, like, yeah. like that, yeah. we got illustrating the book that he, I mean, I just like, I love his passion. I wish more young people had his type of drive and verb. I, mean, I think me, I wish more people in general had his type of self-image and confidence. Mm-hmm. Because for him, like, to leave his, his handler, it's, I'm going to be on a basic show. And they said, no, you can't do it. It's too late. He made a way when they said there was no way. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, he was right. very much an optimist to me. He had a lot of hope. And even, like, I, I want to talk about his last uh, album. I mean, this guy is facing so many years in jail, and yet he had his chance to live out a dream of his, to work at Capitol, like his, like his uh, one of his idols, Frank Sinatra, to cut, like, a, 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 a classy, 
like artistic, like you say, like he got more mature. He had more appreciation of his of his craft, of his talent, and he wanted to, you know, make a great art album that that uh, spoke to his great abilities and range. So can you talk about the last was, album a little bit? See, I, I thought that was interesting too because I remember talking to Susan. She talked to uh, to H. B. Barnum, who was the arranger on that on that session, mm-hmm. and H. B. said to Susan that she it, to to talk to him that d- those days you'd have no idea the trouble he was in. In fact, she said that they had a didn't they have a barbecue or something at HB's house or oh, something? Yeah, Sue, yeah. they I had know. a barbecue that those days and and, and, and uh, David Axelrod, the producer, said that Willie used to come up to his office and they'd have a scotch together and they'd be laughing and having. And he said he was deliriously happy, but of course, Axelrod is a little cocky. He said, "Well, of course he was happy. He had the best players and <laughs> right, exactly. He had the best well, see, studio." And that, but that's why I tend to, to to lean more on what HB was saying. I mean, because you know, he has no reason to, to to color it, you know. But just the idea, he said, you know, he was happy, he was in good yeah. spirits, yeah. he was excited about, and that's and that's and I hear that in the in the uh, in those recordings. I yeah. hear the excitement. Yeah, he was he was he was certainly in good voice. That's some of the some of the best uh, vocal performances I've ever heard from him. And some of those things were one and two takes. That's what was crazy, you know. Oh, it, wow. it's like they didn't get to do overdubs. Yeah. So. Yeah, back then you had to sing the song all the way through. And <laughs> they, they and so, still would do a little bit of, uh, you know, overdubbing. And right. They, they never did get to do it because by then he was gone. He loved right. it now. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, there was evidence, by the way, that that, that they have take what, take this and yeah. take that and take well, that. They, he was he was singing those songs from beginning to end. You, I mean, yeah, if, yeah. if 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 you're a singer and you and you're from that school and know the difference between this and that. I mean, I've 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 sang it. I've had I've produced it. You know, on a lot of different levels with different uh, artists. And um, you you can tell the difference if a, if a, it, you know it's a feel because you, you have you have little imperfections. But if a person is is really that's the kind of thing that. That that very few people can do. That the kind of stuff that he, that my dad could do, uh, I I know for a fact that 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 Stevie could do it. I know for a fact that Jeffrey Osborne could do it. Levi. I know for a fact that Levi Stubbs could do it. I I know for a fact that Luther Vandross could right. do it. I mean, it's certain it's certain singers that could do that. You know, mm-hmm. other singers they they just say, well, I'll sing as far as I can, and then we'll stop right there. We'll roll back and we'll pick up from there. The kind of feel you get from my dad, from Luther, from 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 Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, from you know all these different artists and stuff, it's just it's just pure, it's just real, and it's just you either get it in or at the end of it we'll get it in the next time. You know what I'm saying? And right. so you had to be creative on the fly. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it it it's an amazing it's an amazing art to that. It's mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, it ain't for everybody. I mean, hey, well, you right about that. I just think that. Um, the picture, like I know, I talked. I had the pleasure of talking to um, Malcolm X's nephew, Ronnell Collins, uh, earlier this year after the book came out. That Dr. Manny Marable, who I also interviewed back in 2007, his book about Malcolm X, and um, you know, uh, his nephew wrote a book about Malcolm called The Seventh Child, because Malcolm was his father's seventh child. And this uh, well-known publisher asked him a question. He said, "Do you want to write a book, or do you want to make money?" And he, you know, <laughs> and y'all know that question well, right? And like he, he told, he told the publisher, "Look, I want to make money and write a book." You know, he said, "No, you can't do both. You either want to make money or you want to write a book." And basically, what he was saying is, you got any sensationalized stories about your uncle? You got any uh, tidbits or any scandal? And to me, when I look at your book, and you know, like, people, you know, I read articles. Some people said, "Well, Willie John was self-destructive." I don't think he was self-destructive. I think he was very playful and very childish at times, but I think he had a love for life and people that not only showed in his music but showed in his relationships with people. So I think it's like a it's a it's a miscast of him to paint him as a self destructive being who didn't really appreciate his talent. Matter of fact, he, he loved life and he did appreciate his craft. Exactly. I think I think I think you're right. I think you're right. But see think about this. A seventeen year old, you put him out on the road. Mhm. You know, all these new experiences, all these things he's not used to. I mean, you should. Nobody can handle that. Nobody exactly. can. Exactly. Can, right. can you imagine being 17, 17 years old and you're out on the road? You know, and 
and you know everybody's telling you you know you're you're great and this that and the other. You, I mean, you're gonna have you're gonna make some mistakes. But getting back to your thing about the the book, are you gonna are you gonna make money? Are you gonna this book for us is a, a, a labor of love. It's something that we wanted to do for a long time. You know, we were fortunate enough to find an author that shared our our vision, that shared our passion for the truth, but not sensationalizing it, not not dwelling on it. Okay, this happened, you write it, you talk about it, you don't dwell on it, you move on to the, to the next point. Because sure. life is a lot, life is not about one or two things that you do. It, it's about the flow of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know, And so we wanted someone to write and talk about the flow, about the person. Because see, he had music, and then he had a life. He wasn't just one, a one-dimensional character. Right. He was a person, like all of us are. And so peop- we wanted people to see the whole picture mm. yep, of the man. As he's been so forgotten that people, you know, have a very sketchy vision of him at that. So yeah. anything anything adds to the picture. And when they when they hear him sing, they, they just want to know more about him. So. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I was one. I'm one of the people. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's an amazing person. The more I find out about him, the more I respect and admire what he has left us. Because like your legacy, not was it was no, it's, it's what's left. And he left a man. I mean, in the sun, you know, you got these beautiful sons and and you beautiful, wonderful writer uh, who basically did a great job to his legacy in terms of his definitive biography on the man. And the fact that he's not forgotten. But the folks who knew him and remember him well, they are, you know, vanishing. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, they have, I mean, I, I just think this is interesting about uh, people like Little Willie John is the fact that um, it seemed like, like, I, I'm a fan of Jimmy Lunsford, and he's buried in Memphis. And uh, he started music education here. And a lot of musicians and people celebrate the reason why they are known is because of the foundation he laid in the public school system here. But he's been forgotten about in a lot of ways. And I, and I think the reason is that he catered towards black audiences. And I look at somebody like Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington, I know he played at black clubs, but mostly he played for most of the white people. And he was exposed to them, you know, and they wrote about it and they talked about it. And I think a lot of us, is, a lot of people in our community, we know about Little Willie John, the old heads, but they don't do anything to tell the next generation about Little Willie John. They don't, right. like, for example, like I, I went to college in St. Louis. And every time I go back there during the summertime, I can see little white kids at Bush Stadium or whatever. And I, I can ask them about the Gas House Gang and about Roger Hornsby. And they're about 10 years old. And they know, or, you know, they know all about the history of the Cardinals. Mm. Right. But you, right. Know, but you go to a Sunday Rollins concert, it's mostly like little white kids mm. there. Or, it's like, you know, it's not, you know, and Detroit is such a, I mean, I talked to Gerald Wilson. He loves Detroit. You know, he come on the Detroiter. I went to Cash Tech High School. You can help the mm-hmm. Detroit Jazz Festival and bring back folks from Detroit. Mm-hmm. And they'd be mm-hmm. celebrated, but you can't have a, a Memphis jazz festival and bring back musicians from Memphis who are jazz musicians because they're not known about it. It's weird how certain cultures and cities respect their own mm-hmm. versus other places. Right. right. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we're, doing, we're doing our part to make sure that Detroit, Michigan never forgets it. Mm-hmm. No, they won't. They shouldn't. No, it was really interesting. The, the first um, kind of signing we did in Detroit, and Kevin popped up uh, as well. Um, there were a bunch of people who showed up from Willie's generation. That you know, some older people. One was Levi Stubbs' sister Thelma. Mm-hmm. One was um, Jackie Wilson's sister. Mm. So those people have not forgotten, and they were. It, it's really kind of cool to talk to them on the phone if they call me at the news because they're so grateful that. We're writing about their, you know, one of the biggest stars they ever knew. Right. Right. Because for them, he he was huge, and they just can't believe it was forgotten, and that 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 it's being brought to light again is really great for them. So there's that. There's that generation. Then there's younger people who can rediscover this, and and there's the, for the baby boomers, it's kind of funny because they'll say, "Well, leave my kitten alone." Yeah, I know the Beatles song. You mean, right. Exactly. Who, 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 who did that? <laughs> Oh my gosh! How yeah. come I don't know him? The interesting, the interesting thing to me, though, being a creative person musically, is that uh, as Evie was saying when he did the the forward, when you hear all a lot of these new newer artists, as in like Usher, right. you know, like say from Usher to Michael Jackson, 
even if you don't know who my dad was, you know his, some of his work because it comes right through and it hasn't stopped and it's not going to stop because all these people now from 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 the contemporary today R and B pop whatever right. uh, blues jazz and all these different areas there's somebody that's that's carrying that torch now mm-hmm. you know that creative torch so it just goes on and on and on and on inspiration that's how it goes it travels through all these different generations stuff like that you know the people who influenced my father that torch was carried by my father and then. And the next generation, and the next generation, and so on and so forth. So it, it doesn't stop; it continues. The knowledge is what stops, and that's what we're trying to do right. with this book: is to just let people know that it didn't start right there, it, yeah. but they carried the torch, and they're yeah. carrying the torch right now. You know what I'm saying? And, and Ryan, th- think, Ryan, think about this too. Mm-hmm. The name, you know, who Robert Palmer was? Robert, yeah, he, he passed away recently. He worked with Motown. No, no. no. He, he's the he's the guy that I did. Mine is well, face it, you're addicted to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know yeah, the right. no. he, had, yeah. He, had, he had the girls and stuff, you know, they all yeah. look the same. Now, <laughs> here's interesting. Now, you think of Robert Palmer, you never would think about Lil' Willie John. No. But, you know, Robert Palmer was a Lil' Willie John fan. Mm. He recorded at least two Lil' Willie John songs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. And one of them, my brother heard for the first time, I sent it to my brother, he heard it for the first time a few days ago, mm-hmm. and he said, man, Kev, he said, he's singing it just like Dad. <laughs> we're, we're trying, uh-huh. you know. So yeah. so he didn't even it alter it. I mean, the ambiances and everything. He, I mean, he just went, he, he was so influenced by that song that he took his voice and sang the same song Pretty much the, the same, same way. way. See, oh, wow. and here's what's <laughs> interesting. And this is not one of, was not one of his bigger hits. Mm-hmm. It's it's a song called my, my my baby's in love with another guy. Okay. I'm I mean it's called later letter to my darling. No, my isn't baby's it, in it, love with another guy. Wait, isn't that letter to my darling? No, I feel so, so alone. alone. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. No, because I, I know because yeah, because yeah. I know that song. No, but it, it it was funny to hear it, and then I knew my brother hadn't heard it, so to to have him. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And to have him hear it, yeah, it was like wow. Yeah. Because see, that was at least the second song that he had recorded. It was a Louis John song. Yeah. And nobody else had ever recorded that song, and it wasn't like it was a big hit. Mm-hmm. It was one of these obscure songs. But see, artists are album listeners. You know, sometimes the public may listen to the hit or the or the single or right. the A side. Right. But artists. Our album I listeners. Listen. Keith That's and right. I used to grow up listening to. We would turn the B side when um when I was it. I want you back. Then I want you back. Uh, no, nah, and then want you back was one of those because one more chance was on the flip side. Right, but the I mean, one, one more chance. No, who's loving you? Yeah. was on the flip side of I want you back. But then it was either ABC or the Stop the Love You Say. On the back of that was I found that girl yeah. with Jermaine's yep. first song. Yep. So oh, wow. we used, we listened to the to the B side because you because. Those are the gems sometimes. Yeah, we wanted all of it. We were like, give it up. Come on. This, this, is, this is like food. This is like energy. You know. Get up. Uh, and you know what? I'm with what Kevin was saying, another person who <clears throat> we actually make the second print, if we can get in touch with him, is David Bowie, uh, okay. a promoter, a promoter uh, that, used to, that recently, uh, I think, left uh, Live Aid. Uh, I'm sorry, Live Nation, the promotion, the promotion company that promotes all of the, the major concerts in in the U.S. and and abroad. Um, his name is Larry Meggett. He's out of Philadelphia, and he's good friends with uh, Gamble and Huff. Because I remember he said he went to school with them or something like that. Every time I see him, he comes. He would come to our concerts uh, when, when I'm working with Stevie and. He, and and when I see him, we we just break out and start singing one of my dad's songs. You know, he he his favorite song is is a uh, a cottage for sale. And 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 sometimes I wouldn't even see him, but I would hear him singing, Our little dream castle with every dream gone is lonely and silent. The shades are all gone. And, and and then when we look at each other, we just bust out and start laughing. He was the one that told me that David Bowie was a huge fan of my father. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was different because David Bowie's music has gone from left to right yeah, and yeah. back to right. left again. You never, you never know. But I mean, it's always good. Yeah. But but you know, the, 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 his music is just really, really interesting. And and not, and, but, but not really and and you wouldn't really think, no. right? And you wouldn't think of my dad as being somebody that could mm-hmm. have influenced him. But you just never know. Uh, some people. Take a, a song that my dad did, and like he was saying with the Robert Palmer thing, and they kind of carbon copy it. And mm-hmm. other people, they take us, they they take 
uh, that influence, and they put it in their own. They make it their own. Sting. Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and Sting as well. Sting as well. Yes. Wow. So his legacy Sting lives. Love, right? Mm. Yeah, need you love so bad. Yep. Yeah. We that that is the one song that has been recorded by more uh uh recovered by more artists and successful artists like from Fleetwood Mac to Bonnie Raitt to BB King did it twice. Um B. B. Uh, Sting did it. Mm-hmm. Cheryl Crow, right, he did it the second time with Cheryl Crow. Uh BB did it the second time with Cheryl Crow. And I mean, it's just it's just a gem of a song, but but the first influence came from LWJ, Lil Willie J. Oh. And and talk about who just did Let Them Talk. <laughs> the oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I heard it was a uh, got bad reviews from you all. So I, uh, well, <laughs> wait, who did who did it? Well, I, did, I didn't review it. I just put it up. <laughs> who, who did it? The guy who the played... Uh, <laughs> what's his name? What's his name? Um, Hugh, Hugh Laurie, the actor. Yeah, Lou Horry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait, he sang it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So he no he he didn't get very good reviews for his singing um, from elsewhere from people who reviewed it music critics. Yeah, right. I, I, I didn't review it. In fact, I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting treatment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. You said with that, I said interesting treatment. That's all. It's a different take on it. But you know what somebody okay. said in the book? I'm just a paraphrase somebody. Like it, it went on. It was comparing Little Richard. Y'all wrote about Little Richard versus uh, Willie John, and somebody said that uh, you know Little Richard was a performer, but you know. But Willie John could flat out sing. He didn't have to, I mean, he could dance like everybody else, but the fact that he had such a phenomenal voice, he didn't need to. Yeah. yeah I mean, it was just exactly. another gift he had. Mm-hmm. So, that's what, that's what I mean, he was, he's gone, but he's not really forgotten. Actually, he lives the fact that so many folks have been influenced by his genius and, and have paid homage to it. It shows that, you know, he's a phenomenal talent because I tell people all the time, there's a difference between greatness and success. I mean, you could, right. you could be successful and not be great. But you exactly. could be, not have success here and be phenomenal. Because greatness speaks to immortality and timelessness. And your your father was, you know, your father was one of a kind. Yeah. yeah. Well, and thank you for one. saying that. We appreciate it. We, yeah. we appreciate I appreciate that. y'all. And uh, I'm, I'm glad. How can people get a copy of this book? How can people get in touch with y'all and find out what's going on? Well, well, the, well, the, 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 well, see, I don't know what city you're in. The, the easiest way is probably Amazon.com. They, they, they have the book. They stack yeah. they, they, uh they stock it. They they keep it in stock, but their local their local bookstores, you know, in the areas that may have it too. So I can't really some, I can't really speak to that. Some Barnes and Nobles have it, and if they don't have it, ask for it. They can order it. But you know, any bookstore can order it. So do, that's a good you know, point. Too. Yeah, just you, you can do that. We, we've had friends up here in Detroit who asked their library to, to stock it, and then they did. Exactly. Exactly. But, but people have spoken. But but locally here, the book beat very very uh, they've been very very supportive. The owners there, uh, Mar- Mar- Marwell, my center right through, um, yeah, Mar- up near Uni- Detroit. University of Detroit. Yeah, it's right near Wayne State. From Wayne Mar- State Mar- University, yeah. And uh, Book Beat is in Oak Park. They they Book Beat has a lot of autographed copies. Um, and Barnes and Noble and Royal Oak has it. Um, yeah, with, there's a couple other outlets that are going to have it soon too. And That's uh, excellent. like you said, in all of the online deals, Amazon.com, Walmart.com, all of those have it. That's great. Yeah. So I mean, like you know, so you can be able to find you got the online, you got you know, local place in Detroit supporting the hometown hero, a true original, a true oh, okay. American original. Uh, and so I, I'm just glad to hear all that. And um, people also can find y'all on Facebook too. Yeah, yeah. Face if you go uh, ser- do a search on Facebook on Fever, Little Willie John's, Fast Life, etc. You'll find the Facebook page and you can like it. And we have updates there. We we also have a lot of um a lot of copies of the book in Harlem at the Human Bookstore. Right. At on Fred- Frederick Douglass Boulevard. We just had a nice story in the um, New York Amsterdam News about it. Mm. So and there's a couple bookstores that are like the L.A. and San Francisco. Mabel John had book signings out there. That's good. Um, yeah, Alexander Books in San Francisco, they've got it. So slowly but surely, he's making his way, making his rounds, and the story oh, yeah. won't die. I just oh, want to yeah. thank you, Sister Susan and, and the John brothers, for doing such an extraordinary job of bringing this guy's story back to the light again. 
Oh. And I look forward to whatever treatments it get in terms of even a musical, probably. Or even if they can find anybody to sing like that. <laughs> uh, but I, well, even the movie. But I just want to thank y'all once again for doing this this work of labor of love and also of passion. Uh, it's going to benefit so many people for generations to come. Thanks. And I hope you Detroit Tigers won. I don't know. It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look but good. They look good. Okay. <laughs> well, I want. I guess it's almost. I guess it's after midnight. So I'm gonna play another Willie John tune, and you know, it's called Sleep. And so I hope you have a great sleep. Uh, I want to wish everybody a great night and the words of great Duke Elton. We love you all madly. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you.